In this episode of Undictated, we speak with Dr. Franz Cronier, independent political and economic analyst and head of the Social Research Foundation. It's all about the battle for the province of KwaZulu-Natal, where the latest polling has the two sides in South Africa's political divide, both below 50%, the multi-party charterists and the ANC stroke EFF coalition possible alliance who knows but uh, france will be enlightening us on these numbers and where to from here it's always good to talk with you france you are a natural for providing context on what's going on in this complex world of ours particularly the complexities that are in the political side. We had a conversation with Chris Pappas recently, my colleague Chris Dane, and he was quoting the Social Research Foundation numbers, saying it's KZN is very much in play. But let's go to the source. <laughs> Unpack them for us on, on how the polls look at the moment. Okay, we, we were in KZN a month or so back. Um, did a big sample focused only on the province. And uh, these are the results. ANC down from 54, 55% in the 2019 election on the provincial ballot, down to closer to 40. In Kota, up from the teens into the low 20s, and the DA up a bit from the teens, and the EFF relatively flat. The importance of that is that if those numbers hold, and they, they may not, things can change. If they hold, Natal will become one of the first provinces to become a South African coalition government. The second one that's also likely to become a coalition government is Gauteng, where the ANC on, on a very bad day over the last year has been in the 30s in Gauteng. They're unlikely to break too much above 40% at all. And those two provinces matter a great deal because the Western Cape is firmly in the DA's control. So it's growing in strength in the Western Cape. And if you are the ANC and you don't govern either of KZN or Gauteng, what that means is that all that's left for you are the deep, rural, increasingly aged, kind of almost dust bowl, scrubland provinces. And if the ANC is isolated in those alone after this election, even if it still has a national majority, which it may have, that will accelerate the ANC's already accelerated evolution to become a regional and increasingly rural party, which will mean that South Africa's uh, established and aspirant and younger voting middle class types and aspirant middle classes will pass it by completely and in the fullness of time it will become quite a small party and an increasingly less relevant party, Alec. Yeah, that's big stuff. And uh, When you just look at the ANC as it's currently constituted with a leadership pretty old uh, by most um, comparisons, what, how old is Ramaphosa now? He's in his 70s. Uh, Montash certainly is. It's, it doesn't seem to be too much young blood coming through, and perhaps that has been reflected in the popularity. But I've got to ask you this, Franz. Anyone who's informed on where South Africa is, why would they, or even if they're uninformed, why would people still vote for the ANC, given the mess that it's made of our country? Well, look, amongst um, urban vote, let's split the country in half. We'll have an urban election and we'll have a rural election. If we had those elections, in urban South Africa, the ANC would get 30%. So it has already lost the, the urban aspirant youthful middle class. Lost those 10 years ago. In rural South Africa, it would get between 60 and 70%. And the reason for that is perfectly easy to follow and quite reasonable and logical that rural South Africa is disproportionately populated by poorer very much older, less educated people who have living memory experience of growing up as black people 
in apartheid South Africa and rural apartheid South Africa. It's very hard. So that's where the ANC C, C base remains. And then that constituency is disproportionately responsible for holding the ANC at above 50%. Now, on a simple demographic projection, so we've done these things, um, the, even if the ANC doubles down on its rural constituency, which some of its strategists are not very good think that they should do, if you double down on that constituency, it's being eroded by immigration and the country's mortality rate at such a rate that within 10 years, the ANC you know, could be fighting for 20 to 30% of the vote. That's how serious the predicament is, and therefore how very important the deals that are struck in KZN and Kauteng are going to be, because if the ANC loses governance in those two provinces, its irrelevance will will accelerate. We saw that in the town in the Western Cape recently. We did a big sample there, and what that sample showed is that on on the data in the week or the weeks that we did that, the EFF had replaced the ANC as the official opposition. So where the ANC doesn't govern for a time quickly fades into irrelevance. So that, that's what we think we read in the Western Cape trip. And and I, I, I think there's enough there to say that this is certainly plausible for what will happen to it in Gauteng and KZN if it's excluded from government in those two problems. But surely KZN is also very rural. There's a, it's still the most populous province in the country. There's still Jacob Zuma. Um, is he a negative or a positive for the ANC? I guess that's a, a big card that if you were an ANC strategist, you have to now consider if it's a Trump or actually a two. Yeah, listen, um, yeah, amazing. In urban Gauteng type, urban South Africans find this hard to understand. We test the favorability of political leaders. Um, and, and that's really the, the affection that people hold for them. Mustn't be confused with the propensity of people to vote for them. Sometimes these things go together, but often they don't. So do, do, you, do you like the guy? Do you, do you have sympathy for him? Do you, do you, do you feel warm and, and happy when you see and hear it? Um, in KZN, Jacob Zuma's the rock star of KZN politics. His favorability scores are off the charts, high, way beyond. A, a rivaling Mandela's uh, favorability in that, in that province. Thabo Mbeki doesn't do very well there. Ramaphosa doesn't do very well there. The, the opposition leaders are all way down. So here, here's the dilemma for the ANC. If you run a election campaign that creates the impression in the minds of KZN voters that you are hounding or persecuting Mr. Ramaphosa. We asked that question by Mr. Zuma. We asked that question. Do you believe that Mr. Zuma is being treated fairly or unfairly? Vast block of KZN voters say he's being treated most unfair by, by, by the government pursuing him. If you pursue him, you, you're going to get knocked way down in the town. If you stop pursuing him, and try and make him or, or his, his, his political allies the face of your Natal campaign, which you'd need to do if you have any chance of, of getting your Natal number up to near 50, you greatly alienate your, for example, Gauteng, ANC, emergent and established middle class voter. So the ANC's broad church uh, starts to become a liability here. Um, and all that we're seeing in this is, is something to be expected, that the country's politics is fragmenting in an ethnic fashion, in a class fashion, in a regional fashion, and that the ability to hold that broad church together is going to be very difficult. And I'll just go one step further from that, to your listeners who perhaps remember seeing me in the past in your shows and things will know that the, one of our longer-term forecasts for South Africa is that the politics fragments to a point where the biggest parties are going to have 20 to 30 percent of the vote and our parliament's going to look like a hybrid between the current, it look like the current German parliament, Bundestag, 
And uh, the only reason we had one party dominant politics, either pre-94, one agency dominant politics, pre or post-94, is because up to 94, for 400 years, people couldn't choose their leaders. After 94, the ANC dominance was a hangover of that past. And that was always going to break up, like it's doing between Kauteng and KZN. The moment that lived memory experience of apartheid fades in favor of new political and economic challenge. As that happens, you see the ANC breaks up. And the ANC's got to now make the choice, I think, one of the choices. Is it going to double down on that rural constituency, which I think takes it to a point where it hosts its last policy conference under a thorn tree on the Botswana border and a sort of marquee and remarks about so when we governed in Southern Africa and how great we were? Or does the ANC have a leadership that, that, that tries to strike the kinds of coalition deals that are necessary to attract and retain some of the confidence of South Africa's future voting market, which is a younger, urban, aspirant, middle-class voting market. Alec. So many of the decisions that have been taken by the ANC over the last 30 years have been really bad and being now fully appreciated. Interesting what's going on in China at the moment, uh, where Celia Brink is trying to roll back decades of appeasement by the city council, the ANC city council, just paying more and paying more and paying more, where we've now got a point where it's unaffordable to even give the municipal workers the increase that was agreed a couple of years ago. And that is maybe a reflection of the challenges that were a coalition government to, to come to power next year would have to face. It's not a very appetizing possibility, particularly if some members of the coalition aren't really that staunch. And I, I, I need your guidance here. It's almost like Action SA in KZN and in other parts of the country as well is having, it's targeting its coalition partner, particularly the DA, rather than necessarily it was going all out against the ANC in the past. Now it would be almost, as far as Herman Mashaba is concerned, sacrilege to suggest that they could get together with the ANC but if they get big enough and get enough of a vote, is that a possibility, given the way they're acting at the moment? Who, who, the, the ASA? Action SA. No, yeah. no, no. It, it's, it's, um, well, I'm always wary of commenting on Pacific Party's fares, but on the poll numbers, the momentum that ASA had uh, in Gauteng a couple of years ago has slowed. And regrettably, Mr. Mashaba has not been positioned as a presidential figure who talks about serious questions. You know, one of the questions in, in the future coalition is there needs to be a presidential candidate. Who is that going to be? And I, I think Mashaba certainly had the potential to be a competitive candidate. You, 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 South Africa could have considered all manner of structures of future coalitions, rotating presidencies, all sorts of things. And and I think be, because he hasn't been positioned as such a figure, um, a perception has arisen that his party's become the, the opposition's opposition and delves too often into non-serious and petty questions. And I think that's regrettable, um, still reversible, but he needs to be positioned differently to the way in which he's been positioned. So, you know, okay, fr from there, coalitions. I mean, what, one of the coalition options is, of course, the ANC and um, the IFP in Natal. That was the favoured coalition option for registered voters in KZN, the plurality of the felt that was a, a strong option. The and 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 near that, the on a national level and on a Gauteng basis, the, the favoured coalition deal is the ANC and the DA. And you know, I, I don't think you should go into this election if you were a party or, or something with, with a set 
uh, a view on what your coalition's options are, and you should be open to the best option. But the South African public should also be open to the idea that the bigger party, uh, wary of the demands that some of the smaller parties have been making in the coalitions to date, and the behavior, sometimes outright sabotage, that the bigger parties might start to find each other and say, you know, just think about this. We, we're actually, we, we don't have that much between us, and for the sake of stability, maybe we can find each other. So I wouldn't say it's implausible, and I, 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 I would say I think it's quite sensible, in fact, that the ANC, the DA, and the IFP, and where possible smaller allied partners, do pursue discussion on what to do in KZN and Kaute. You don't need one national deal. You can have different deals in different problems. Uh, with a view to considering what may happen next year at a national level. We've still had the ANC above 50 this year, but it's very close. Certainly by 2029 on the demographic forecast, the ANC does not have 50% at a national level. And uh, uh, the, 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 the moonshot pack, kind of wolf pack idea, very good idea. Keep it, pursue it, maybe it works. But know that there is an alternative. The alternative is that the bigger more established and sometimes more serious parties uh, get together to form a national and provincial governments. Fascinating insights on that one. Just before we leave, uh, the ANC's position on Palestine, uh, you would think that that, apart from anything else, would alienate them from any potential uh, partnership with the DA on one side. The IFP has been a bit quiet about this, but certainly the ANC coming out and saying we stand with the people of the Gaza Strip effectively. Um, maybe they'll change their minds when they see that babies, dozens of babies were beheaded, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that seems to, they might have shot themselves in the, in the foot on coming out so quickly uh, with a response to that. Or how are we supposed to read it, Francis? There's a lot to talk about here, Alec. Um, that's never been flighted in our media, both about the attack, what happened, and who was behind it, how it was planned, and about the local context in Southern Africa, where a rising tide of Salafi jihadism has direct ties and parallels to the terrible violence that's been inflicted against Israel over the past week. The ANC's, anyone who's informed about these things knew early on exactly what had happened. The, the babies that were hacked up in front of their parents, the heads cut off, this, this, this was not. The ANC can't say it did. It's a divide here between the civilization of Western liberal democracies and the barbarism of Iran, which drove this attack, Hamas, and their allies around the world. And the ANC and the South African government have allied with the barbarians. And it's, it's, it's frightening, the implications for us here. The, there is no equivalence here between um, the Palestinian cause and the attack on Israel and the actions of the Hamas terrorists and the actions of Israel's security forces. A lot of nonsense is perpetrated, including in our own media. There is no occupation of Gaza. If we read in our media, it's because of the occupation. There's no occupation of Gaza. There hasn't been an occupation of Gaza for 20 years. 20 years ago, the Israelis left Gaza, handed it to the Palestinians. 
said, do your best. At gunpoint, the Israelis, for 7,000 of their own citizens who'd been settled and with that, uh, descendants of people who'd been settled in Gaza for a very long time, out of Gaza. Two years later, Gazans elect Hamas as their leaders, murderous tyrant. And they set about, from that moment, not building Gaza into a successful community, which they could have done with the support of, of, of allies, Western allies, European Union, not, not just the uh, other Arab nations. Where water pipes were delivered, these were converted into rockets to fire at the Jews. Where building materials we, were, de were delivered, these were uh, applied to the development of Gaza, these were applied to building the tunnels that could be used to murder the Jews. Uh, Hamas sabotages Gazan infrastructure so that Israeli experts need to go in and fix it, and then they try and murder the Israeli experts. This, this, this is, is, is Hamas, like Iran, cannot be moderated or approached in the way that the West has tried to do in, since the nuclear deal in Iraq. In, in, in Iraq. And um, I was sympathetic to some extent to the ANC on, on Russia. ANC had an interpretation of Russia, which deserved a hearing, at least. And, and I said that in a number of, of private encounters, not just in South Africa, but, but also in, in other parts of the world where the ANC came under heavy criticism was Russia's stance. But, but this, the barbarism with which Mr. Ramaphosa and his government has associated itself is at a level that can perhaps never be forgiven. And uh, they would do very well to walk it back completely, no, not to qualify it, but to disavow Hamas, to disavow Iran, get Iran out of the BRICS deal. BRICS has no, there's no justification for Iran to be in, in, in BRICS. And to stand strongly with Israel, which is the leading democracy in the Middle East. It has, Israel has created a degree of religious and civil liberty religious freedom, civil liberties, economic freedom for all of its citizens that compares to the world's greatest, most freest liberal democracy. It's a wonderful society. And it exists in a very difficult security situation where the simplistic solutions of handing over territory, removing Israeli security, would deliver exactly the kind of barbarism and slaughter of Jews that the handover of Gaza is ultimately delivered. And, and, and commentators on this, there's a clear watershed. You're on Israel's side or you're on the side of the barbarian. Because Iran, Hamas and its allies, which now include the ANC, those allies must be aware of this. Hamas will slaughter and Iran will. Every Jew on earth until there's not one left unless they are stopped by the world civilized societies, which South Africa, regrettably, on this question, is not in the camp of. France, sure, that's hectic. What are the consequences for, uh, for South Africa in this divide that you've explained for us? Regrettably, the West wants to exit the Middle East. They don't have an appetite for the kind of security involvement that they should have, at least the liberal liberal governments and administrations in the West. Um, and they would be very reluctant if Israel engaged in a long-term campaign that drew in either on the ground in Gaza, later one that draws in Hezbollah, which is a much more serious military threat than Hamas out of Lebanon, and, and later Iran itself. So they will be discouraging the Israelis, putting pressure on them not to do this. I think Israel should. I mean, I, I think the, the, the only way that, that Israel can now secure its future from another attack of this nature, at least put off Hamas's allies, who will be looking at this thinking maybe they could achieve similar successes, is at the end of whatever campaign the Israelis will now run, Hamas ceases to exist. It is no longer. Its leaders are hunted around the world. The organizations that endorsed it 
are examined to see whether they could be prosecuted. The financial institutions that transferred the money that finances Hamas pursued as well. And um, on the ground in Gaza, the Hamas leadership eliminated. Um, and and don't, I mean, we, we might want to do another call on this if you want to talk about jihadism in Africa. Don't think if you sit in South Africa or you, in, in Southern Africa that this is something that happened to Jews in, in, in the Middle East. I judge that more Christians in Africa have been murdered by Salafi jihadists aligned with Hamas than even the horrific number of Jews that were murdered in Israel. Christians are beheaded in Africa. Their churches are burnt. And they're burnt by the same people who pursue the same ideology, funded by the same backers that set up the attack on Israel. And so this isn't a question of sympathy just for for the Israeli state and the survival of democracy in the Middle East, with the little flame of democracy in the Middle East that Israel is. This is a very close to home question. And if you doubt that, you can drive into northern Mozambique. Try and try that as a sort of run of the mill centrist Christian. You could very well end up being slaughtered by an Islamist in exactly the same way as the Jews were slaughtered in, in Israel over the past several days. So take you back to what you said about the ANC. I think it should reappraise where it stands on this, um, not just because that's the morally decent thing to do, but also because of the contradiction in its message that if it supports this stuff that happened in Israel, Indirectly, it's supporting the murder of the hundreds of Christians across Africa, burning of churches that happens every year with very little global awareness or sympathy. And I think it's an awareness that that needs to be built up, certainly in South Africa, so that more groups develop the clarity of thought that they clearly lacking in either their endorsements of Hamas and Iran indirectly, or the idea that there is an equivalent, an equivalence here between the actions of Israel and the actions of Israel's enemies, and, and there is there is no such equivalence. Dr. Franz Grenier, independent political and economic analyst and head of the Social Research Foundation, giving us context. That's what we're all about at Biz News. Get context, no more. Well, I know a heck of a lot more now than I had before we started this conversation, both about KZN and indeed uh, what's going on in the Middle East right now. Thank you for your contribution today, France. I'm Alec Hogg from Business.com. 